Amen and amen. What a beautiful song and what a beautiful way for us to prepare ourselves to go before the throne in prayer as we prepare to receive his word. Let us bow our heads in preparation for the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you once again with a heart of thanksgiving. Lord, we thank you for this time of year. Lord, we thank you for the gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your Son. Lord, we ask that you will come in and rest with us wherever we are. Lord, touch our heart, touch our ears so that we may hear your word and it may minister to our hearts. Lord, we ask in all things that we do, we do it unto you. We ask for this in your most precious and holy name. Amen. Faith sees the day. Our scripture is John 20, 19 through 31. Jesus appears to his disciples. Also known as Didymus or twin, one of the 12 was not, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Through the doors were locked, though the doors were locked, Jesus, and then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hands and put them into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet believe. The reading of the word. Peace in a time of anxiety. The disciples were locked in the upper room. Early that morning, they'd heard the news from Mary Magdalene. The woman had traveled to see Jesus, but when they got there, his tomb was empty. Peter and John ran to the tomb to check things out, and it was just as the women had said, empty. As the day wore on, their anxiety grew and grew. They were sheltered in place to avoid danger, and they feared for their lives. The disciples were sheltering in place. 2,000 years later, and here we are, self-isolating and sheltering in place. The disciples found themselves frightened and afraid. The same is true for many today. We're fearful of the things that might harm us, both seen and unseen. We're concerned about COVID-19. What if we get sick or what if we are unfortunately one of the families who loses a loved one? We're afraid of what a pandemic means to us economically. As business owners, we fret over the fate of our companies. Workers fear that they may lose their jobs. And people who are already unemployed, they wonder how they will make ends meet. No, there is no lack of anxiety these days. And for some, this hunkering down, this self-isolation, it's simply adding to their stress. I heard a story the past week on social media where a reporter was talking to parents who find themselves at home with their children, while at the same time, they are trying to work from home. Moms and dads are now teachers' assistants while overseeing their children's online school lessons, organized while using every room full time. But they are still boss lady Lala and make it happen Harry when it comes to getting these coins and should I say, still looking good for the gram. Well, needless to say, I know that these parents are overwhelmed and they are reaching their breaking point. Hands down, I think we can all agree that stress is on the rise and we can definitely relate to how the disciples were feeling at that time. Oh yeah, we get it. But then 
enters Jesus through their locked doors. Jesus enters their anxiety-filled room, and of all things, he says, peace, peace be with you. Now, he speaks this into their fears. Jesus, the risen Lord, brings peace, and he just doesn't bring any old peace. He brings his peace. Remember that he is peace, and his presence, the source of that peace. Like children, when their parents leave them with the babysitters for the first time, they're in familiar surroundings, yet still uncertain and uneasy about what the next moment holds. When the disciples were in his presence, their anxiety melted away. Like a child, when his parents return home, in their presence, there is peace. See, anxiety breeds anxiety. When you walk into a situation and it's real tense, you can feel it. Some will naturally tense up as well, but others, the opposite, in fact, is true. One person can walk into a tense situation and restore balance and calm to everyone there. Their presence spreads to everyone because peace begets peace. And a single peaceful presence can mitigate all of our fears. Psychologists and counselors, we talk about how a person can have a non-anxious presence. The non-anxious person conveys an atmosphere of equilibrium to the people that are around them. They don't easily get ruffled nor agitated. With their peaceful presence, they convey a sense that things will be okay. Jesus is the paramount non-anxious presence. And why? Because he's been through it all. You could say that he's been there and done that. See, remember, Jesus was rejected and dejected. He was condemned and cursed. He was chastised and whipped, taunted and tortured. Jesus has carried the weight of the world on his back. And as the prophet Isaiah says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. But he did not stop there. He endured death on the cross. And just when you thought that Jesus couldn't do anymore, he literally goes to hell and back just for you and I. John 1.14 reminds us that the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That we have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only son from the father full of grace and truth. So personally, I like to think that when Jesus got up that Sunday morning, he walked out of the grave with a righteous swag, looked over his shoulder and said, O oh death, where is thy sting? O oh grave, where is thy victory? Because my God is an awesome God. Dealing with doubt. Four teenagers were making all kinds of noise. They were yelling, they were throwing things and running around the car in front of their home. The father of these children told the neighbor when he asked, is everything okay? Looking dazed, he replied, we've just come from the hospital where their mother passed about an hour ago. I don't know what to do and I guess they don't know how to handle it either. I imagine that the disciples felt the same way. They were at a complete loss. They had put all of their hopes on Jesus and through their human eyes, they only saw that Jesus was defeated. But then Sunday morning came and with the morning brought the light of day, the blessed light of resurrection day. Remember, all Jesus was, all Jesus had said, all that Jesus had represented, all he came to do was focus towards this, 
salvation moment. The resurrection of Jesus is his defining moment. More than anything else that Jesus has said or done or accomplished. Now sure, we remember those other things, but the resurrection made him who he is in the eyes of the world. We all remember the story well. It was early that morning when the women went to the garden tomb. They intended to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. And when they arrived, no one was there. As they pondered the meaning of this, the angel of the Lord said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. The women went immediately to tell the disciples. The disciples came running to the tomb, and they too found that the tomb was empty. They all began to realize that Jesus had told them, in fact, the truth. Everything that he said was true. Now, I'm not really sure how they spent the day. We don't spend much time on that. But Luke and John both tell us that late in the evening, when they were all together in the upper room, Jesus came into that room and said, peace to you. Sensing that he was afraid, he said, behold, look at my hands and feet. It is I, myself. Jesus, he was present in the moment with all who were there. He spent his time wisely with them. He was calming them, reassuring them, and renewing their faith simply by being in their presence. But in his all-knowing, Jesus noticed that there was one missing, Thomas. Now, John 20, verses 26 through 29 address that. A week later, huh, kind of like it is now. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was in there with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace to you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See, up doubting. And believe. Thomas says, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus says, Thomas needed to see he is the living proof of his resurrection, and it, that his resurrection was greater than any doubt, greater than any fear. He could not be denied. He was living proof of all he had preached about before. He was proof to stamp out the doubt. All of us have had doubt at some time or another. It doesn't mean that we are disloyal or unfaithful to God. No, not at all. Because Jesus in those moments will say, behold. Perhaps your doubt is severe, or maybe you're one of those where doubt only rises to your consciousness occasionally. But I dare say that doubt has touched each and every one of us at one time or another about this or that. Few Christians can say that they've never experienced doubt concerning the grace of God or his mercy or simply where we stand in the world. And yet, despite whatever we face, whatever trial comes our way, God is faithful to his people. Just as Jesus cycled back for Thomas a week later, so will he wrap back around for you and I, just as he promised. See, we only doubt the things that are important to us, only those things that we care so deeply about. Whether we have doubts or we're feeling uncertain or unsure, I have a feeling that God smiles and seeks to show us even more. Frederick Buechner, a Christian writer and Presbyterian minister, wrote, a God who leaves no room for doubt, leaves 
no room for me. Brothers and sisters in Christ understand that doubt sees the obstacle, but faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night, but faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step, but faith soars on high. Doubt says, who believes? But faith, it answers, I. In times of doubt, God will always reach out to his children. Jesus breathes when we can't. Verses 21 and 22 remind us, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I am a former asthmatic, and uh, I know what it's like to not be able to breathe. Not being able to breathe is one of the things that is the most agonizing and traumatizing in your life. You try not to panic as you rush to the emergency room, and without even having to say a word, the medical staff sees what they need to do. You need a breathing treatment, and you need it right now. So we can only imagine how Eric Garner and George Floyd felt in the final moments of their lives as they were being strangled and suffocated. Six years separate their murders, and now I can't breathe has become the words that have sparked a global cry for accountability. It seems that fear, anger, and hatred has the world in a stranglehold. We need divine help, and we need it now. In our text, we find that the disciples of Jesus are assembled. They're huddled behind closed doors for fear of certain Jews of Rome. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had teamed up with Rome to get rid of Jesus. The Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't particularly care for each other, but they both, huh, yeah, they both, they hated Jesus. They hated Jesus so much that they united in opposition against our Lord. Now, old school wisdom would say something like this. There are people who don't like each other, but when it comes to you, oh, they'll hook up. See, the disciples feared for their lives because they wondered, will the Romans come after them the way that they came after Jesus? The same feeling is true for many of our black and brown brothers and sisters who are frightened and afraid that they too will become the next hashtag or the next breaking news. So yes, the disciples, they were despondent. Their leader, their teacher, their mentor had just died a cruel and inglorious death on the cross. They needed peace. Their minds screamed in grief. Emotionally, they couldn't breathe. Self-isolating, locked in, anxious and doubting, but it was in that mental anguish, it was in that moment that Jesus shows up. Apparently, they had forgotten who Jesus was. You know, Jesus, the one who made the blind man see. You know, Jesus, the one who made the lame man walk. You know, Jesus, the one who turned water into wine. You know, Jesus, the one who raised the dead man from the grave. Yes, that Jesus, my Jesus, your Jesus, the Jesus that said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. Yes, that Jesus. Well, they must have been thought, thought that he was talking about a church building because they didn't know that he was prophetically talking about his death and resurrection. But that day, the Lord gave them a breathing treatment. Remember, church, it all started 
with a breath. God got close, only as close as God could get to a human being, and he blew the breath of life into man, and man became a living soul. We who are human, <laughs> we have the breath of God in our lungs. We are not the creation of our own imagination. We are human beings and we are something special. We are something wonderful, something splendid, because we are the work of God's own hands. And each one of us in our own diversity are made in the image of the one true God. This, this is why when the world heard George Floyd whisper, I can't breathe, we all felt pained. The collective mind would traveling back to Eric Garner. It moved through the 1960s. It passed over our ancestors in 1619. It skipped over the Protestant Reformation and it went beyond the Apostle Paul until it landed in Genesis chapter two. Understand that it all started with a breath. And now we are being refreshed by a second. The breath in Genesis gave us animation. It gave us life. It brought life to the lifeless. But the breath of John 20 is the breath of empowerment to make a powerless people enabled, to make them effective witnesses to what God has done, to what God is doing, and for what God will do. So as we reflect upon this Sunday, let us breathe out anxiety and breathe in repentance. Let us breathe out depression and breathe in forgiveness. Let us breathe out chaos and breathe in healing. Let us breathe out hatred and breathe in compassion. Let us breathe in justice. And thank God, let's breathe in your peace. God has given us a second wind, church. Let us all breathe. Amen.